It's a pleasure to be with so many colleagues from so many different countries, united in our understanding of the power of education to help every person become an architect of their own lives, but also united in our awareness that if we want to live in peace, if we want our children, our grandchildren to live in peace, we need to actively engage in the education, not just of our children, but of other people's children across the, across the globe. So thank you for the opportunity. Education is indeed core to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. And not just because one of those goals, goal number four, is about education, but because if you read the specific targets for the remaining 16 goals, over half of them call for specific knowledge, attitudes, and skills that people need to have so that we can achieve sustainability, peace, security, inclusion. And education is the best means we know to help people, both those in school as well as adults, gain those skills. It is very encouraging that this ambitious agenda outlines uh, such a role for education because when historically we have collectively, humanity, achieve, set education goals of that sort, we have created great things. I will mention two examples. When the universal right to education was included in that short document, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 70 years ago, that sheer act transformed the experience of humanity from a world in which most kids did not have the opportunity to set foot in a school to a world where most of them do today. When 15 years ago, the Millennium Development Goals included two education goals, they set in motion a process that pretty much closed the main access gaps uh, that we have, and great progress has achieved uh, because of that fact. So it is very encouraging that we now have even more ambitious goals. But it gives me pause to realize that this agenda calls for more than business as usual. We have talked about the necessary financing gaps. What would it cost to achieve these goals? However, there is a gap we haven't sufficiently addressed, and it is the practice gap. Equipping the majority of the world's population with the knowledge and the skills to achieve these goals is going to require more than funding education so that we have universal secondary education. Let me give an example. To create the conditions so that women and girls have their basic human rights realized will re require more than getting gender parity in completing secondary education, even universal secondary education. It will require a lot more than creating adequate infrastructure in elementary schools, having lavatories, sanitary conditions. It will require even more than ensuring that gaps in early literacy are closed between girls and boys. Important as those things are, they will require that the school experiences for girls and young women and for boys and young men are such that both women are empowered to imagine a world in which they can reach leadership positions and become the architects of their own lives. And they will require experiences that liberate men from the prejudices that make them into perpetrators in reproducing a world that denies women those opportunities. Let me give you two examples of what that means. I had the opportunity to evaluate a leadership, youth leadership development program implemented in schools in Mexico that provided young people in public schools the opportunities to identify a problem in the community that they thought was important, to negotiate with their peers which problem to address, and to actually do something about addressing that problem. That, pro that program had tremendous impact in the self-efficacy that women had, had tremendous impact in raising their aspirations for themselves, had tremendous impact in their motivation to remain in school, but more importantly, it had, it had also impact in how boys construed the rights of women and men as a result of working together with these uh, young women. Similarly, I had the opportunity some years ago to do an impact evaluation of the implementation of an entrepreneurship education program in six countries in the Middle East. And the experience of going through four months of participation in a program that taught young people how to create a business, women and men together, had similar impact 
in self-efficacy, in aspirations, not only in the knowledge that young people would have about business and how to create business, but how, in, how they thought of one another, in their attitudes about reflected in questions such as, if jobs are scarce, men should have priority uh, over women. Once they participated together in creating this business, young men were much less likely to hold on to beliefs of that kind than before or for participating or for those who didn't participate. So this is not going to be business as usual. This is going to require a lot more attention to the relevance of education, to ensuring that we not only provide more resources, but that the education we are providing is in fact aligned with the competencies that the targets of the SDG compact require. There is a lot of scientific evidence on what are the competencies that help young people become self-authoring individuals. And that evidence can be grouped in three domains, in three buckets. Cognition, which is what most curricula around the world, most schools around the world are focused on. Self-knowledge and self-management. When I talk about self-efficacy, it belongs in that category. When I talk about the capacity to reflect uh, and learn from one's experience belongs in that capacity. When I talk about things like persevering, belongs in that capacity. The leadership program I just developed is designed to develop these kinds of capacities. And the third bucket is the capacity to get things done with other people. The world is changing and power, traditional power structures are indeed dissolving. And what is fundamental is in this day and age for people to understand that there are gonna be very few things that we're gonna achieve alone. And the capacity to be able to work with others effectively, to resolve differences, to negotiate them, to set common goals, requires the explicit, the intentional design of opportunities for students to gain those capacities. That is what those young women and men who participated in the INJAS program that taught them how to create a business were learning in that, in that program. That is what those young people in Mexico who participated in, this, in the leadership development program were gaining. And so the question is, how do we do this at scale? How do we use the existing infrastructure that has been built over the last 70 years, producing one of the most remarkable transformations in human history, one that has brought every young person to school to actually help them have experiences that empower them, that make them self-authoring individuals? I think one of the ways to do that is to learn from good practice and particularly from good practice at scale. We have just heard about such one such example of practice designed to provide this education in peace building. Uh, we have heard about programs uh, for Syrian refugees that are teaching those young people coexistence and how to get things done across lines of difference. At the moment, I'm working with a group of colleagues in several nations around the world, China, India, Singapore, Chile, Mexico, and the United States, examining to what extent the existing curriculum and standards provide students an opportunity to gain the competencies I have just described, and where are the biggest practice gaps? Where are the areas where we need to pay more attention in helping teachers gain the competencies necessary to support um, these experiences? And we have a book coming out in March uh, that you'll be able to find, published by Harvard Education Press, discussing that. Um, let me give you an example of some of the new competencies that we need to develop. Let's talk about global competency. By global competency, some people mean ensuring that people have high levels of educational attainment, that more people finish high school, that more people get access to college, which is very important. Others mean ensuring that what they learn in the basic literacies is globally aligned, that when you learn mathematics or science in any country, what you're learning, the content that you're accessing is comparable to the content in any other country in the world. And that is also very important. But we need to give more attention to developing what has been called by one of the panelists global civility or global citizenship. Providing the knowledge and the skills and the dispositions that can help us engage in the world. See, if we're going to achieve the SDGs, we're going to need support from most people. Now, you know what percentage of the population knew about the MDGs? I can tell you that for the United States, it was 5% of the population. And there were very low levels around the world. So how do we get the necessary support to the financing we're discussing when people don't know the facts? Hans Rosling has conducted in his famous ignorance uh, survey very simple tests of college graduates and people who haven't gone to college, where he finds, for example, that most adults do not know 
what the impact of the MDGs was. Most adults do not know that poverty rates around the world have over the last decade. In the US, is one in 20. And what is worse, there is no difference between college graduates and those who haven't gone to college. So without knowledge, without knowledge of the basic facts, how do we expect individuals to commit to financing the very institutions and the mechanisms we have created to advance a world that is sustainable? And that is the subject of global education, uh, which should become part of a curriculum. It should be what defines an educated person everywhere. This is a painting by American painter Norman Rockwell. It's titled The Golden Rule. When the UN was created, Rockwell, which was a big fan, sketched a painting that tried to represent this commitment to multilateralism. It was a sketch that had the representatives of a few governments, and in the background, the people. And he sat on that sketch for a decade, and finally, the painting he produced is this one, where he foregrounded the people and the government representatives are gone. I think this is a very apt metaphor for what development is for us. Development is not about what government representatives do, not about what elites understand or care to do. It is about the people. It is about empowering every citizen on this earth with the skills they need to create a world that is indeed sustainable and where we can live in peace. We have a lot of work to do. These are data from the World Values Survey, which is administered every seven or 10 years uh, for the last eight decades around the world. When people are asked, to what extent is tolerance equality that should be cultivated in children? Not everybody thinks that this is important, and there is huge variation, as you can see here. For example, in a country like Australia, close to 90% of the adults believe that, yes, indeed, young people should be educated to be tolerant. But in a country such as South Korea, that percentage is only 50%. And you can see variation across countries. Furthermore, things seem to be moving in the wrong direction. In the previous administration of that survey, I'll just point some examples. The value for tolerance was much greater. In China, it was 70% of the population compared to now 50%. In South Korea, it was 65% of the population compared to 50. In the US, it was 80% of the population compared to 70 now. So we should ask, what is it that school systems are doing, or more importantly, failing to do, so that the newer generations are less inclined to believe that we should raise the next generation to be tolerant and accepting of those who are different than themselves? When we ask people to what extent, in, when people are asking this survey, to what extent would you trust someone of a different religion? The percentage who would say they would trust completely is under 10% in most countries around the world. The percentage who would trust them somewhat is a little bit better, but there's still a third of the population who would not trust at all or completely distrust those of a different religion. How can we have peace in a world where we increasingly come into contact with those of different identities where we don't believe we can trust them? Extremely intolerant views, as the same is true for nationality, same is true for immigrant status, same is true for language. Extremely intolerant views, such as those who believe that the only acceptable religion is mine, are also cause for concern. And so even though those who strongly agree are under 10%, you have those who agree with that, and you have a good fifth of the population in many countries around the world, they don't need to be a majority. If they can organize, they can hijack through the democratic process and have inordinate representation and create conditions that cause the breakdown of the institutions we have created so that people can work out their differences. This is why we have in this day and age people who kill each other over differences in religion in countries that are otherwise civilized and advanced. So how do we do that? We have three sets of challenges and they include, first of all, a tremendous challenge of design. Yes, we will need innovation and disruption innovation because it is not business as usual. We should ask all this effort we have made to get every kid in school should be to what ends? And we should spend time and deliberate and look around the world for examples of good practice in designing curriculum that incorporates what is known about the competencies that will prepare people to take care of their lives, of their families, of their communities, to be contributing members of society, to work across lines of difference, to be indeed global citizens. But we also have challenges of implementation. Once we figure out how to do that, we're going to have to figure out how do we build the capacities. And I cannot underscore enough how important teacher professional development is, because most of what goes under that name around the world is not worthy of that name. We call professional development these little courses that three days duration, five days duration, disconnected from what people want to learn, care about, disconnected from their work environments, which don't move 
the needle much at the end of the day. This is one of the big areas of opportunity for the coming decade, developing systems that effectively build the human capital so that we can make these institutions, institutions capable of empowering kids. And finally, we have issues of scalability. Is this doable? I think it is doable if we use not the tools of the past, not the approaches of the past, but the power of networks, the powers of discovering that many of these problems have already been solved at various scales in different parts of the world. And if we can create improvement networks, and if we can rapidly use convenings like this one and the follow-up conversations that technology enables, we should be able to achieve in the next 10 or 15 decades the same kind of progress that we have achieved over the last 70 in providing every person on this earth the right to be schooled so that we actually turn that right into the right to be empowered, to work with others, to produce a world where we can live in peace with one another. Thank you.